Civil War. It is a specter that hangs over all nations. If civil war is reached, that usually means a country had or has been fucking up, and a reckoning with their failures has come. Civil wars have been fought for numerous reasons. To maintain an economic system, to depose the current government, to fill a power vacuum, religious supremacy over a nation, yada yada, we can start civil wars all day. But one civil war stands over them all. A civil war that killed more people than World War I, and killed around 26 times more people than the American Civil War. It took place in the only nation a war like this could even happen. China! A nation that's in a completely different tier when it comes to waging massive war and suffering mass civil strife. The shit China has been through would make any other nation shit and piss its pants in fear. That civil war is known as the Taiping Rebellion, which saw the Qing Dynasty of China go up against the upstart Taiping Heavenly Kingdom, started and led by a man named Hong Zhiquan. But before we talk about the man who is Jesus' Chinese brother and the King of Heaven, we need some context into China's current state of being. Welcome to 19th century Qing China! It's shit! China is coming off a humiliating defeat in the First Opium War, starting what will later be referred to as the Century of Humiliation. Now you may be curious as to what an opium war involves. Is this like the war on drugs? Well, not exactly. Despite being technologically and militarily inferior to European nations such as Britain and Portugal, China saw itself as both naturally and culturally superior. And not without good reason, as they had the oldest and longest lasting civilization in the world, were quite wealthy, and produced the finest artisan goods and teas that Europeans were fiending to get their hands on. And due to this mindset, only traded with European nations in a very limited and government controlled manner, which saw China trading valuable artisan goods such as silk, porcelain, and exotic teas for only one good, silver. Now this trade was heavily in China's favor, as European trade partners were trading their universally valuable silver for individual goods that were only going to be used by rich wankers and slags to drink their tea out of. So Britain specifically began looking for another good that they could trade with so they could stop pumping pounds of silver into China and also get an advantage over the Qing. And that good happened to be... Opium. Britain would grow opium out of colonial India and ship it en masse into China. The influx caused skyrocketing opium consumption in an addiction crisis. Along with general societal breakdown that having large numbers of unemployed vagrant opium fiends usually cause. Qing China attempted to ban opium trade and consumption, and began attempting to expel the British presence out of the city of Canton, but this pushback from the dynasty worked exactly only to I've escalate tensions, resulting exact. in the first opium war breaking out, with China and Britain clashing in several naval and land battles, seeing China's navy get absolutely sunned by the juiced-up British Royal Navy. The war ended in 1942 when the British captured Nanking and signed the Treaty of Nanking, one of the most disrespectful treaties in human history. That was essentially Britain strong-arming and straight-up bullying Qing China into giving them what they want by forcing it to cede land, pay 21 million buck PayPal and war reparations, and to open up more port cities to Britain. Along with making Britain China's official favored nation, these treaties also blew the doors wide open for other Western nations to begin exerting their own influence over China. This was terrible optics for the Qing dynasty. They looked weak. Pathetic even. Some unwashed barbarians from Europe just took a huge shit all over their glorious nation, and the government was useless in stopping them. The economy was as shitty as their treaties, taxes and rents were sky high, and opium was destroying societal cohesion and morality. The government was corrupt and was choked by inefficient bureaucracy, and banditry and small wars amongst warlords were common. It's here where we meet our protagonist, born as Hong Hoju. Hong was born in Guangdong province to a well-off Hakka family, the son of a minor elected official and a farmer. Young Hong aspired to be a bureaucrat, which is fucking hilarious on paper, but in traditional Chinese society, being a bureaucrat or government official was actually a great honor. And in Qing China, in order to become one, you had to pass the Imperial Civil Service exam. In practice, this exam was more like a mental torture scenario than any test you've taken in your life. The exam involved working for three days and two nights writing essays in an isolated cell, quoting classical Confucian literature, and even if a single character is messed up, you automatically fail the exam and must wait around three years to take the exam again, if you could even afford to. The exam had a 1% pass rating, but if you were able to pass it, your life and the lives of your family and friends would be greatly elevated, both financially and socially. So Hong got to work, starting his studies at age five. By age 10, he could recite all classical Confucian texts from memory and was leading his peers in preliminary exams. He grinded and studied until he was 13, traveled to the city of Guangzhou to take the exam, took the exam, powered through those three days of work, submitted his work, and failed. Fuck. Well, okay. It's not the end of the world. He's only 13. He'll be able to take the exam again, several times more in fact. In the meantime, Hong returned to his village and became a school teacher, and dispensed knowledge to the youth until he took the exam again at age 22. Another exam, another L. Fuck. 
But while in Guangzhou, as he was bombing his second exam attempt, Hong ran into some Christian missionaries, where he was given the pamphlet Good Words to Admonish the Age, written by Chinese convert Liang Fa, which promoted New Testament doctrine and criticized traditional Confucian teachings. Hong, unfazed by this pamphlet, was still set on being a government employee and planned to take the exam a third time that next year in 1837. He never actually read the pamphlet, but he also never got rid of it. Third time's the charm, right? Nope. A third exam, a third L for Hong. This time, however, the failure was too much for Hong. He freaked out, suffering a nervous breakdown, leaving him sick and delirious for several days. While suffering from this breakdown, something unexpected happened. Hong received a curious vision in a delirious fever dream. In this dream, Hong was in heaven, and he learned that he had an entire heavenly family, complete with a heavenly father, mother, brother, son, and sister-in-law. The heavenly father, who sported a golden beard and a sleek black dragon robe, bitched to Hong that the people of the Qing dynasty were worshipping demons instead of him, and gave Hong a golden sword to slay said demons with, and his heavenly brother taught Hong the art of demon slaying. Finally, the father told Hong his name violated taboos and needed to be changed, suggesting Hong Jiquan as a new name. Thoroughly convinced of this vision, yet unsure what to make of it, Hong shrugged it off and continued with his studies for the imperial examination, taking yet another fat L after failing for a fourth and final time in 1843. After his fourth and final L, Hong was visited by his cousin, probably visiting to give him some moral support. He noticed and asked Hong about that Christian pamphlet he had gotten in Guangzhou. Hoping it would give him some direction, Hong began reading through the pamphlet for the first time, and as he was reading through it, his mind lit up. That vision he received began making sense. That heavenly father? That was the capital G God of Christianity. And the brother? That was none other than Jesus Christ. Meaning that Hong was the second son of God and younger brother of Jesus H. Christ himself. What an honor! And that mission God gave him, the one to wipe out the demons with that epic sword he gave Hong, those demons God was bitching about were the Qing dynasty themselves. And it was Hong's duty as Jesus' little bro to overthrow them and install a Christian monarchy to rule over China with. Hong seemingly wholeheartedly believed in this revelation. He was reborn. A fire had been lit within him that could not be contained. And his first act was to rid his crib of all the false idols he owned. He destroyed all Confucian and Buddhist books and objects he owned, smashing and burning them like a lunatic. He then began preaching his cool new religion to his local community, getting himself fired from his teaching job for calling Confucius a false idol. He soon found some initial success amongst his relatives and other Hakka Chinese who had also failed their imperial exams, one of whom was his cousin Feng Yushan. Hong, Feng, and their small band of new converts began preaching to nearby villages around Guangxi province and started smashing all their holy statues and acts of religious defiance, with Hong even commissioning the creation of two giant ornate swords that he called the Demon Slaying Swords to smash the idols up with. Unsurprisingly, villagers and local officials were not happy that a bushwhack gang of zealots led by some imperial flunky claiming to be the son of God were vandalizing and destroying their property with giant swords, causing Hong and his crew to get run out of town. After traveling and preaching in Guangxi for about five months, Hong returned home and resumed work as a school teacher, while Fang continued to preach the new good news and kept gathering new followers. Hong eventually was invited to study Christianity further under Reverend Issachar J. Cox Roberts in the city of Guangzhou in 1847. There he converted to Protestantism and was denied a baptism over Hong's disagreements on current Christian stances on tolerance and forgiveness, as well as Roberts accusing Hong of bending Christian doctrine to suit his own needs and goals. Hong left the reverend later that year and set out in search of his cousin Feng to check in with how his preaching was going. While traveling, Hong was robbed of all his possessions by bandits, including his epic demon slaying swords. These swords are now a holy grail of lost media as they have not resurfaced since they were stolen, which is a damn shame. Despite these hardships, Hong was eventually able to link back up with cousin Feng near Thistle Mountain, and not only was Feng there, but there was also the Society of God Worshippers, a 2,000 strong secret society that Feng had built up after him and Hong had split ways. These god worshippers were completely faithful to Hong and Feng's new doctrine, and once Hong arrived, they immediately propped him up as Heavenly King. This marks the unofficial founding of the Taiping Heavenly Kingdom, but it would not use that name just yet. The kingdom would need to be forged in the fires of war first, but that's still a few years out. In early 1848, Feng Yunshan managed to fuck up somehow and ended up getting arrested and banished to Guangdong. So Hong left the god worshipper encampment to go collect him. When they returned almost a year later, they had found two members of their following had stepped up into leadership positions in the cult while they were, had been gone. Yang Zhuqing and Zhao Chaogui. 
They claim to have the power to enter a trance and speak in tongues as members of the Holy Trinity, with Yang speaking for God and Zhao speaking for Jesus. Despite what seemed to be a usurpation of power, Hong and Feng defuse the situation by investigating Yang and Zhao's claims. They ran a factor cap check, no cap detected, and actually agreed with their claims, allowing their God speaking to continue. Now that Feng is back and the cult is stable, Hong continued his work on completing his new doctrine. Despite being God's son and Jesus' brother, Hong himself wasn't actually very knowledgeable about Christianity. The only things he knew about it came from his pamphlet, his time with Reverend Roberts, and a Bible translated into Chinese. Now the Bible is cool and all, but this isn't the West. This is Ching China, bitch! The Bible would need some new rules. Hong created a new Bible, known as the Authorized Taiping Version of the Bible, which is just THE Bible but with details changed by Hong to be more to his liking. Like removing the mentions of Israelites drinking wine and the removal of verses detailing Lot's entanglement with his daughters. Hong pitched this new Bible to his followers as the original text of the original Chinese religion that had always existed in China until it was buried and wiped from history by Confucian imperials and replaced by their heretical dogma. Hong and his Bai Shang Di Hui, which means God's worshippers, continued traveling and preaching this fancy new doctrine throughout the Guangxi countryside. Guangxi province, like I mentioned about Qing China as a whole, was in some rough-ass shape. Located in southern China, Guangxi was brought into the Qing dynasty fold during their rise in the 1600s. However, this expansion into Guangxi did not also include the only few good things an imperialist expansion brings, such as expanded infrastructure like sewers, roads, and water irrigation, with the Qing dynasty essentially treating it like an irrelevant backwater, leaving it and its peoples to rot and squalor. Bandits infested the hills and pirates floated up and down the rivers, and as Hong and his band traveled and preached, they became more radical as they went along, witnessing the desolation and hopelessness of Qing rule. Hong was gaining a decent amount of support in the region, especially amongst other Hakka Chinese. Now I keep bringing up the Hakka ethnicity, and that's because ethnicities in China were, like many other times in history, unfortunately extremely important at this time. The Qing dynasty was founded and ruled by Manchu Chinese, a minority group from northeastern China, most Chinese were of the Han ethnicity, and the Hakka were a subgroup of the Han. This presented an interesting opportunity for Hong. He's a Hakka that already hates the Manchus. They failed his ass four times! And many of the common folk have no love for the Manchus either, whether they be Han, Hakka, Cantonese, or so on. Their nation just got humbled under Manchu rule, and their province is a rundown shithole. It appeared as if the Manchus didn't even care, or maybe even had animosity towards the Hakka and other groups from the south, and the Manchu-run government looked like nothing but a bunch of decadent, foreign pussies. He could stoke the popular anti-Qing and, by extension, anti-Manchu sentiment to quickly grow his numbers despite the average Chinese peasant not having much reason or want to join a radical proto-communistic theocratic monarchy. Hong began going mask off, denouncing the Manchus as literal demons and prophesizing an apocalyptic battle that would take place between the forces of good, the Taiping, assumedly, and evil, the Qing, assumedly, that would take place within China. Now this prophecy would absolutely come true but in a much different way than Hong was probably expecting. The Qing were fucked. Not only did they have to deal with bandits, pirates, and unruly villages, there was also now an upstart iconoclastic cult led by a man claiming to be the brother of a 2,000-year-old messiah from Jerusalem, denouncing them as literal demons gaining strength in the south. Not only that, these problems were compounding themselves when the bandits and rabble they were trying to quell were joining up with Hong and his Baishang Di Hui militia, further inflating these separatist numbers, growing to between 10 to 30,000 followers by 1850. The Qing were starting to sweat about this cult. Not only were they organized into a militia and had considerable fighting force, they were also running on an engine fueled by contempt for them, their government, and religious zeal. Wanting to suppress the problem before it could really get out of hand, the Qing ordered the god worshippers to pack it up and go home, and when they refused, the Qing attacked. Surprisingly, the god worshippers held strong and repelled the attack. This galvanized the rest of the cult to take up arms and prepare for the inevitable battle to come. That battle came in early 1851, when the Qing attempted a full attack on the god worshippers at the town of Jintan, where they were based out of. The Qing got absolutely sunned by the god worshippers, who had mobilized into a proper army under Hong and Feng's leadership, starting a battle that would be known as the Jintian Uprising. They won the battle, beheaded the Manchu commander of the Qing army, and Hong declared this victory to mark the founding of the Taiping Heavenly Kingdom, with himself as the king of the kingdom, and Feng Yushan as king of the south, and other kingships handed out to Yang and Zhao as well. Let's take a quick minute to explain Taiping power hierarchy, as it's pretty unique, to say the least. Leadership in the Heavenly Kingdom was split amongst Heavenly Kings, usually a king of a cardinal direction, such as the King of the South, East, West, North, a King of the Flank, and then Hong above them all as THE King of Heaven. He is Jesus' brother, after all, so he gets to be king. 
All the kings claim to be able to enter trances and speak directly as members of the Trinity, and Taiping legal policy was usually made during these geek sessions, as the deities would speak the laws they desired through the kings. Later on, however, Taiping leaders would be referred to as princes rather than kings. Hong and his followers were riding high off this big first dub, and wasted no time in continuing their campaign, starting an offensive march north into Hunan province, capturing towns and cities along the way and picking up new recruits. The Taiping were rolling now. Hong's convincing victory at Jintan had people looking at him like a giga-chatted military genius and a possible messiah. That combined with his popular anti-Qing government rhetoric allowed him to easily recruit many Chinese peasants, tradesmen, and other groups disillusioned with the Qing government. The Taiping, despite being a self-alleged heavenly kingdom of God, were doing some pretty ungodlike things, and were more akin to an early version of ISIS than any righteous holy nation. As they, like ISIS, were a religion-based insurgency that captured large swaths of land in several cities from a government in strife. Also like ISIS, they were extremely brutal to their oppositions. Any who refused to join the Heavenly Kingdom were killed, along with any Manchus they could get their hands on. The Taiping Heavenly Kingdom could easily be seen as a terrorist state to those looking in. During this campaign, the Taiping suffered their first major loss. Hong's cousin, King of the South Feng Yushan, was shot by a Qing guard of Quanzhou City while they were passing by. After Feng had been shot, the Taiping Horde, who had initially not planned to attack the city, turned around, sieged the city, breached the walls, and slaughtered anyone they could find within. Feng would go on to die of his wound only a few weeks later. West King Zhao Chaoguai also had died in this march, after taking a small force to try and capture the city of Changsha. The siege of the city had stalled out, and in an attempt to rally his troops to fight harder, Zhao donned his fancy noble robes, held a large banner above his head, and moved to the front lines to command his troops, where he promptly had his left shoulder blown off by a cannonball, dying of the wound a month later, with the siege eventually failing. Hong then elevated King of the East and Speaker for God Yang Zhuqing to be his right-hand man, which would end up being a bit of a fateful decision. As he was the last remaining OG king, and wielded the most influence in the kingdom behind Hong himself. The Taipings continued north until they reached and took Wuchang City in December of 1852. After capturing it, the Taipings decided to turn east and follow the Yangtze River, heading towards the regional capital of Nanjing. By March of 1853, they were at Nanjing's front door, and by March 19th, they had captured the city entirely. Hong's first order of business was to stroke his ego and name Nanjing as Tianjing, his new heavenly capital. His second order of business was to destroy his ops, exterminating any Manchus he could find, killing the Manchu men outright and having the Manchu women forced out of the city and burned alive. The Taiping then struck out on subsequent military campaigns to the north and west to expand their territory, with the North Campaign coming within 70 kilometers of the Qing capital of Beijing. It's here where the Taiping Heavenly Kingdom was really able to solidify their new lifestyles of their new kingdom. The Taipings were very puritanical and dogmatic, banning smoking, drinking, dancing, opium, gambling, slavery, prostitution, and sex. Even sex between married couples. This prudishness was caused by a mistranslation of the Ten Commandments by Hong, banning not only adultery, but licentiousness as well which fully segregated men and women. Even children couldn't interact with their parents if they were of an opposite sex. The punishment for breaking these rules usually resulted in a public beheading. They were also highly militarized, waging a total war against the Qing, with each citizen given military training and were conscripted into the fight against the Qing dynasty. Western missionaries who came to check out this wacky new take on Christianity were shocked and horrified by their extremely puritanical beliefs and penchant for mass violence, usually leaving the kingdom in disgust and confusion. The Taipings also introduced many proto-communistic ideas, such as the abolition of private property and social class. They were also very progressive for the time on women's rights, elevating them to be equal to men, and they even had their own army units comprised of only women. Now Hong had it all. He had campaigned across China for around three whole years, and had just captured a former capital and major city. He had a holy army of over a million strong at his back, who believed him to be the son of God. Surely he would rule wisely and justly to ensure the survival of his new kingdom, right? <laughs> of course fucking not. In fact, it seems once Hong got a taste of true, uncontested power, he folded damn near immediately, withdrawing from public view and administration shortly after taking Nanjing to go yuck it up in a magnificent palace only issuing commands both religious and administrative via written proclamations. Hong was too busy for that bullshit. He was too busy smashing all that box in his newly created harem and getting faded than a hoe to actually rule as heavenly king. In the meantime, the real administrative responsibilities fell to Yang Zhuqing, who began building railways, postal services, taxation systems, and reorganized the army. 
Yang put Hong's communal reforms into practice, overseeing socialized land ownership and eliminated social class in Taiping society. Yang tried to gather support from Western nations for the Taiping, hoping their Christianity-based religion would garner favor for their new kingdom from the West. Most nations stayed neutral on the Taiping, however, which in hindsight was a great choice due to how chaotic and unstable the Taiping kingdom actually was, and how wildly differently they practiced their version of Christianity. To a Westerner, Taiping Jinquanian Christianity was as foreign as Confucian or Taoist religion. By 1855, Yang seemed to have grown discontent. Why should Hong get to jack off in his palace all day while he has to do all the real work of actually running a functioning state? Fuck that! He has a network of spies and wields lots of influence in the army. He should be heavenly king. So Yang started publicly challenging Hong, calling Hong a fake and a fraud, and said that God was only talking through him and that Hong was capping about his ability to speak as a god. Hearing this traitorous slander, Hong called on the King of the North, Wei Chong Hui, and some of his other generals to destroy Yang and all of his followers in Nanjing. They stormed Yang's palace and killed him, his family, and all his servants. For the next three months, Wei slaughtered anyone with connections to Yang, civilian or not, eventually killing 27,000 Nanjing citizens in these purges. Wei eventually turned on Hong as well, making plans to imprison Hong and usurp his position as heavenly king. However, Hong learned of this plot and had Wei executed for his treachery. These betrayals within betrayals and plots within plots began to show that the Heavenly Kingdom had a severe chain of command problem, and these events, later known as the Tianjing Incident, would mark the beginning of the end for the Taiping Heavenly Kingdom. Shaken by this incident, and with all the original kings either fled or dead, a much more cautious and paranoid Hong began changing how the Taiping government was run. Fearing another challenge to his rule, Hong only began promoting his underlings based on their loyalty to Hong and not for any skill or merit they may have. Any dream of a communal utopia was gone, as Hong had now fully cemented himself as a theocratic dictator. In Qingland, things were still shit. What else is there? While the Taiping were violating the city of Nanjing in southern China, the Qing were caught up in the Second Opium War against Britain, but with France joining in on the fun this time. Another Opium War, another embarrassing L. But now the Qing had finally caught a break. Small armies were starting to crop up in response to the fanatical Taiping army ravaging the Chinese countryside. Now these upstart warlords and their armies would usually be at odds with Qing authorities, but they were actually fighting on the side of the Qing due to them hating the Taiping just a bit more than they hated the Qing. As they were followers of the dominant Chinese Confucian tradition and were fearful of this new Christianic dogma, they began to retake Taiping gains, taking back the previously mentioned Wuchang city in 1856. These battles continued up until 1860 when the Taiping fully exterminated the remaining imperial forces besieging their capital Nanjing, opening up the way for the Taiping to capture nearby cities such as Hangzhou and Changzhou. They also tried to capture Shanghai, but the siege ended up failing and they retreated back to Nanjing. Not only was this a much needed dub for the Qing, it also compelled the British and Americans to start arming the Qing to fight back against the Taiping more effectively. The Taiping posed an existential threat to their neutered, bent over Qing dynasty that they had just spent two opium wars strong arming them into submission over. The Qing, now rejuiced from their new western toys and training, along with a much needed manpower boost from the upstart new armies, were now looking to get back at the Heavenly Kingdom. This is when the war really started getting ugly. Not that the Taipings haven't been ravaging southwestern China and been destroying cities for years, but now the Qing were getting just as destructive as they were. The Qing made for Nanjing, paying back the Taiping in blood to the fullest extent, raising Taiping controlled cities to the dirt, and mass executing prisoners and civilians. Almost none were spared. It really started to seem like that apocalyptic battle Hong had been raving about for years was actually happening. Fields burned. Citizens died in famine, died of plague, or were slaughtered when entire cities were wiped off the map. Human flesh was widely sold and eaten as farmland and supply lines were destroyed. The Taiping didn't give up easily, however, as vicious fighting continued amongst the chaos, with each side continuing the mass butchering of enemy-controlled cities and the destruction of enemy farmland and infrastructure in attempts to weaken the other side in any way they could. It was probably the closest you could get to an actual hell on earth. One of the most brutal and important battles being the siege of Taiping controlled on Qing in the fall of 1860. Qing armies had surrounded and cut off supplies to the city. New army general Zhang Guofan even had gotten naval support from Britain to blockade the city. However, the Taiping and their fanatical loyalty to the Heavenly Kingdom refused to surrender and slowly starved within the city walls. After a year under siege, the city finally fell in the summer of 1861. Qing troops entered the city to find evidence of human flesh meat markets and reports of mass cannibalism. The Qing then slaughtered the remaining living men and carried off 10,000 women as war spoils, maybe sparing only some children. The capture of Anqing opened up the Qing's river routes they needed to reach the Taiping capital of Nanjing, reaching it and besieging it by late spring of 1862. 
Although the Taiping outnumbered the Qing at Nanjing, the Qing held strong and were able to withstand attempts to repel them from the city. By summer of 1864, the siege had become protracted. Starvation gripped the city and the Taipings were growing desperate. <laughs> Taiping generals went to Hong and urged him to evacuate the city, but Hong refused, saying as long as they had God on their side, they would never lose. However, even Hong could see how desperate the situation had become. Hong, for the first time in years, actually stopped smashing box, put down his heavenly bong, left his palace, got to work. Seeing that his city was choked and starving, Hong hatched a plan. He told his citizens that God had sent them some mana to eat, just as he did with the Israelites when they were lost and starving in the desert, and that they were to go collect said mana, making citizens forage for as much food as they could, mostly finding weeds, grass, wild vegetables, and berries. Once the mana was gathered, Hong allegedly blessed the food, cooked it, took a bite of it, and then promptly keeled over and died of food poisoning. Although this is just a story, as Hong's true cause of death was never recorded. Other theories speculate that he may have died of illness, suicide, or some other poisoning method, but all we know for sure is that he died on June 1st, 1964. Hong was then succeeded by his 15-year-old son, Hong Tianguifu, but by the time he ascended, the Taiping Heavenly Kingdom was already a cooked product. It was absolutely, unequivocally, over. The apocalyptic battle had come, and they were on the losing side. The Qing eventually broke into the city and were forced to fight brutal door-to-door -door urban warfare, slaughtering households one by one. Mass suicides occurred with large groups of people lighting themselves on fire in one last zealous act. After three days of battle, an estimated 100,000 people died within the walls of Nanjing. All prisoners captured by the Qing were executed. All Taiping princes and officials were put to the sword. Hong Tianguifu attempted to escape with a few others, but he was also caught and executed. At the end of the siege, the Qing dug up Hong Jiquan's corpse and beheaded it to confirm his death. They then cremated his body and shot his ashes out of a cannon to ensure his spirit and body could never find a true resting place. Which is just insane disrespect. They were smoking that Hong pack, literally. And with the fall of Nanjing, the Taiping Rebellion was effectively ended. Sure, some holdouts continued to fight in the southern Chinese highlands until around 1871, but they were reduced to a doom rebel group, with their city sacked, leaders dead, and population scattered. By the end of the uprising, anywhere from 20 to 30 million people were dead, mostly from plague and famine caused by the war's brutal destruction of farmland and infrastructure. That at the time accounted for 2% of the world's population, and was at the time the greatest loss of life in a war in human history until World War II, a war involving over 50 nations. Some even argue the number may be up to 100 million deaths, which if true would be a literal incomprehensible loss of life. The craziest part? This wasn't even the end of Qing China's problems, not even close. Following the collapse of the Taiping Heavenly Kingdom, the Qing's bloodthirst still hadn't been quenched, and they began unleashing massacres on the Hakka people, slaughtering up to 30,000 Hakka a day at the height of their purges. This came on top of concurrent rebellions and clan wars in southern China that killed an additional million people. In 1984, Japan invaded China with their shiny new imperial army, with Qing China losing dominion over Taiwan and the Korean Peninsula to Japan. In 1899, the Boxer Rebellion broke out over strong anti-foreign sentiment, that war causing another 100,000 total deaths after it was put down. Finally, Qing China fell in 1911 in the 1911 revolution, which saw the Qing dynasty fall to revolutionaries which then devolved into warlords and upstart monarchs fighting for any power they could grab. China was caught in a sort of neo-warring states period, defined by instability and chaos. In 1931, Japan invaded again, taking Manchuria, leading to the Second Sino-Japanese War during World War II, in which an estimated 20 million further people died, and included atrocities such as the oh. Nanking, Unit 731 Human Experimentation, and innumerable comfort women taken as sex slaves. After Japan was forced out of China, the Chinese Civil War broke out between the Nationalists and the Communists, with the Communists, led by one Mao Zedong, who was an admirer of the Taiping Heavenly Kingdom's early Communist policies. The Communists eventually emerged victorious, forcing the Nationalists to retreat and establish themselves in Taiwan, a schism that is still unresolved to this day. Mao's rule and reforms led to at least another 20 million deaths across mainland China, and Mao made sure to honor Hong in the kingdom through museums, statues, and speeches. Good fucking god they were not lying about that century of humiliation. Defeat after defeat after rebellion after rebellion after invasion after invasion after civil war after civil war saw China lose numbers that would wipe other nations off the map completely. Chinese history really stands uncontested on the world stage. They had wars so destructive entirely within their own nation that put up death tolls that couldn't be touched until a massive 50 country war broke out, a war that saw both a and use of nuclear weapons, which makes it fascinating. 
I hope you enjoyed this video, and I hope you found this episode of Chinese history to both be interesting and kind of unsettling as well. Thank you very much for watching. I love you all.